Hey everyone, happy Monday. Today on The Final Bar, we'll talk about the S&P 500 making a new high for 2023, staying above 4,500. Strong trends remain stronger. We'll talk about some of those key groups and sectors continuing to press the upside. Also, some key stocks reporting earnings this week. We'll let you know which ones you should watch coming up shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. The technical toolkit is really designed you to think less about what should happen based on your analysis, based on your biases, based on what you read or what you see. It focuses on what actually is happening, the evidence that the markets provide back to us in the form of price and trend and momentum, digging into indicators like breadth indicators, many of which becoming a bit overheated as the S&P continues to push above 4,500, continuing to go to the upside. Some of those leading groups like Apple, Home Builders, others continuing to have these nice strong trends that keep getting stronger. So if you have a trend follower hat, if you haven't put it on by now, I encourage you to dust that off and put it on your head, try to navigate these markets. We're gonna look at all the charts you should pay uh, pay attention to, including some key stocks reporting earnings here uh, during our market recap. Let's get to the recap right now and share with you some of the, uh, the movements in the markets, what they mean short-term to long-term. First, I wanna start with a poll question. We asked you recently, which type of moving average is skewed to the most recent price action? Simple moving averages, exponential moving averages, triangular moving averages, or a current moving average. Well, the last one, current moving average, I made that one up. I also I always enjoy making at least one of these up, and uh, and that one is not is not a thing. So sorry, that's not right. Triangular moving average actually is weighted just how it sounds. You kind of weight the middle of the data the most, and then it's lighter to get to the front or get to the end. So obviously, that's not going to skew to the most recent price action. A simple moving average is one of the biggest issues with like a 200 day moving average is that what happened today and what happened 199 days ago have an equal weight and a lot of people find that that's a pretty poor way of actually weighting price action over time isn't today's way more important than what happened 200 days ago that leads us to the correct answer exponential moving average the point of an exponential average is every day as you get a new observation you weight a certain percent to that new observation as a result it ends up being a little more sensitive meaning when the market reverses the exponential average will always turn a little more quickly than a simple moving average and a lot of times if you're thinking about a trading system or some sort of trend model uh to uh to overall define the trends exponential average is usually a really good place to start compared to some of those other moving average combinations by the way if you don't understand everything i just said about moving averages and how they're weighted this is where you can use our chart school uh portion of the stock charts website it's a free portion of our website has a bunch of great technical analysis data. I know when I was studying for the CMT exams, I used that free resource heavily, and I would encourage you to uh, to do the same. Thanks so much for answering those polls. Make sure you subscribe to our accounts on social media, on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to the channel as well. You won't miss the next poll. Good way is to uh, to nudge your thinking as a uh, as an investor. Let's look at what happened in the markets today. As I mentioned, the S and P. Uh, having a nice update, continuing to push to the upside. Major averages rolled over a bit going into the close, but sort of the strength of the day had really been felt by that point. Uh, overall, pretty nice, uh, pretty nice up move. The S and P, as I mentioned, the Nasdaq making new highs for 2023. The S and P was up about. 0.4%, let's zoom into the data here, to 45.23, a little bit below that. The NASDAQ composite, uh, composite up almost a full percent to 14,245. The Dow up the least, but still up about a quarter of a percent. Mid caps and small caps having a decent update uh, as well. And the S&P 100 mega cap index up 0.4%. The VIX actually pushing to the upside. And I love to highlight when the S&P and the VIX move together because we often think that the S&P and the VIX are inversely related, which over time, there is a strong inverse relationship between stocks and volatility, between the S&P and the VIX. But on an individual day, you're a little short-sighted in your thinking if you think that they're just moving inversely based on their calculation. That's actually not true. The market can move higher on increasing volatility and it can lighten up, go down on lower volatility. It's really measuring two different but related things. 
Overall, the reality is the VIX down around 1350 still, one of the lowest readings we've seen in the last uh, two years. One of the lowest readings we've seen in the last 10 years, to be honest with you. You have to go back to sort of the 2000s, like 2016, 2017, for the last time you had a VIX down in sort of that 13 handle, sort of 13 point something. Uh, and it shows you how far we've had more of an elevated volatility uh, type of environment. Just to continue on, let's look at the interest rate uh, markets or the uh, the bond markets uh, and uh, and look at what happens here. We have 10-year yields coming off just a bit to 380, we'll call it, 379. Uh, long bond yields around 392 and the five-year yield holding uh, right around 4%. Now, the five and 10-year points were both down a bit. Uh, long bond yield actually ended up being uh, pretty uh, pretty stable. What's interesting is Rates overall have fluctuated quite a bit, but directionally, if you look at the chart of the 10-year, which on our um, uh, site is dollar sign TNX for the 10-year yield uh, print from the CBOE, if you look at that, you find that uh, you know interest rates are sort of coming off of that high recently around 4, 24 and a quarter. We're down to around 4%, so still pretty high relative to five years ago. But overall, we're not sort of pushing higher. Bond prices have been uh, sort of holding steady there. Stock prices, of course, have gone up, but not as, uh, but more than bond prices. As a result, rates are sort of holding uh, holding steady. What's so interesting about this with the 10-year, the five-year points right around 4%, you really haven't seen value stocks dominate. For this rally in growth stocks to feel pressure from the fixed income markets, I think you'd have to see higher rates from you. You need to see the 10-year get back to four and a quarter, if not even higher. I don't know if I'm seeing that in the cards based on the trends. So far, the trends are actually remaining uh, fairly steady. The dollar down just slightly today, not too much from uh, from Friday's close, but the dollar index, dollar sign USD, has really broken down. We'll try to make time to look at that chart because that's one of the things giving room to the major equity benchmarks and other risk assets to move higher. Weaker dollar basically gives room for those other things to uh, start to do uh, a lot better. A lot of red on the charts of uh, commodities or on the, uh, the table of the commodity returns today. Gold slightly positive with the GLD up about 0.1%, but everything else moving in the red. You can see crude oil prices, copper prices, natural gas, uh, even soft commodities like corn prices all moving uh, to the downside. So there could be this new super cycle in the commodity space. You're certainly seeing some signs of renewed strength in uh, gold and gold stocks, but not today, more weaker rather than stronger. Finally, in crypto land, Bitcoin just continuing to frustratingly not follow through when it breaks above 30,000. It's been a number of times here in 2023 where we've sort of announced the break above 30,000. Remember when the Dow breaks above a major milestone, you get you know traders on the floor wearing the hats with the uh, with the new high on it. I feel like our Bitcoin hat, we just have the same hat. We keep putting it on to celebrate continued tests and, and break above 30,000, but then we come right back below it. So Bitcoin currently just below there, not too much of a drop today, but over the weekend kind of came off of 32, 31,000 down to below 3,000. Ether price is down below 1,900. So again, in the cryptocurrency space, you have sort of this push and pull, these competing forces, additional regulations or the threat of additional regulations, which tends to put pressure on prices, new ETFs filed, new optimism, new upside targets, for these, uh, you know, Bitcoin to 120,000 type of uh, targets, all of a sudden push uh, prices right back up. At the end of the day, Bitcoin kind of holding steady right around 30,000. So not really following through to the upside as much as you might like if you're on the bullish side. Finally, looking at sector returns here, technology in the driver's seat yet again. This has been, you know, in a lot of ways, the story of 2023 has been tech and the FANG sectors and then everything else. But you're seeing strength in some of the other areas of the market. We highlighted last week and, and in previous weeks, things like industrials, even materials starting to show some renewed signs of strength. Today, it was technology at the top. The XLK was up 1.3%. Financials, number two, up 1%. That's interesting because there was uh, quite a bit of uh, of news around um, earnings at the end of last week. We were off at a guest host. Uh, Julius DeCampeter did a great job on Thursday. And if you missed his conversation with Todd Gordon, I'd encourage you to go check that video out. It's a really cool conversation. They touched on a lot of different things. Then we did an all mailbag episode on Friday, which was, which was a lot of fun to put together. But we sort of, uh, you know, banks were reporting earnings there. Uh, at the end of last week, we have more banks coming up the beginning of this week. The XLF continued to push a bit higher and showing some, you know, some signs of strength as well. Consumer discretionary and industrials right after that around 0.4%. Number of sectors were down, although the worst performer sectors were not down too much. Utilities down 1.2%, followed by real estate 
and then healthcare. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500, sort of check in on where we're at relative to where we've been. You can see the new high for the year here today. On a closing basis, we, we certainly did it getting above 45.20 and remaining above 45.20 going into the close. Intraday high, a new one as well. So what's interesting about the chart of the S&P 500 here is you see the break above that pink shaded area around 4,300. That's also right about where the 50-day moving average is at this point. That's the higher low there at the end of June. We then made a new high getting about 4,450, a new high for the year that also really followed through to get above the August 2022 high. And now we're pushing above 4,500. So what's interesting about the chart of the S&P, in my opinion, is two things. Number one, if we would pull back, let's say the remainder of this week, earnings, which don't appear to be particularly rosy. I think we're going to see signs from uh, companies that there's the slowdown in the economy that the Fed has been trying to manufacture. I think you're going to see some of the signs in uh, the earnings reports that we're, uh, we're going to hear with some of the key names that we'll, we'll highlight here in a moment. Uh, but overall, that could put downside pressure in stocks if there's a lot of downside shocks and, and underperformance uh, based on uh, some of these earnings releases. What's interesting is you have this shaded area right around 4,300. That's some Fibonacci levels. That was a key level of resistance and support. Also, the 50-day moving average all right around that point. So if we would rotate lower, I think you have a clear level of potential support to focus in on. So that's point number one. Second point would be the fact that the bearish momentum divergence that we highlighted from mid-June to late June, from mid-June to the 4th of July weekend, higher highs for a lot of key stocks, also the major averages, and lower momentum is often a concerning sign. What's happened now is we've reversed that by making new highs on stronger momentum. That's how that divergence can be eliminated or be alleviated. So for now, it's actually showing you that there's probably further upside to uh, to be had. If we do get further breakdowns, we'll talk about some of these other levels like heat trend line support, maybe some further drawdown potential. But for now, certainly giving that long and strong uh, up and to the right sort of feel. Now, the Nasdaq, of course, feeling uh, plenty strong uh, these days as well. Apple um, didn't quite make a new closing high for the year, but got very, very close retesting the high from uh, from a couple of weeks ago, pushing just nearer and nearer to $200 a share. And again, all of this is getting to new all-time highs, pushing above the highs from the end of 2021. The strength in the FANG stocks, the strength in Apple and Microsoft, some of those others, has really dominated, I think, a lot of investors thinking in 2023. What's so fascinating is look how much of a rotation that was from weakness going into the holiday season to strength coming out of the new year. And from there, it's been very light pullbacks, right? This one in February was the worst. Other than that, it's been minimal drawdown, just continued upside. And when that's what I'm seeing on a chart, as much as we can debate as to why Apple shouldn't go any further, what Apple's valuations are, a $3 trillion market cap, the trend doesn't care about all those things. You're continuing to see people willing to pay more for it for whatever reason. As a result, the trend's going to tend to persist. And when I'm looking at a chart like Apple, things like home builders would be another group where I think you're seeing that same sort of mentality. ITB, the XHB are the two uh, most liquid home builder and, and home construction ETFs. Continuing to make new highs, right? Highs on Friday and sort of continuing to hold those today. So you're continuing to see strength in some of those leadership groups. I don't see any signs on the chart that that's changing. I can tell you red flags that tell you maybe we're overbought. We may be overextended, but we've seen those signs before and they haven't really played out. What's interesting is a chart like the ITB has had numerous pullbacks to an ascending 50-day moving average. Get nervous when that sort of pullback does not hold. For now, I'm seeing uh, plenty of strength uh, with a uh, leading group. That brings us to the ARK Innovation Fund. Very different look than the chart of Apple, but it also an equally impressive, if not even more impressive, uh, 2023, making a new swing high with the ARK, uh, ARKK getting above 45 uh, about a week ago. I wrote an article on stockcharts.com. By the way, to get to that, go to our articles page. You'll find this one that says absolutely everything going up. And what we'll share with you, if you go to that article, it's all the, uh, the, the, the ARK Innovation Fund really being driven by some of those key names, right? It's it's charts like Tesla, like Coin, others, Roku, which have had uh, you know dismal 18-month periods all of a sudden rotating. And the first six months of this year have been particularly strong. And the last six weeks have really accelerated that move to the upside. ARK Below 45 is a languishing chart. It's a struggling chart at a time when others are doing quite well. Mark above 45 is a breakout chart. That's a chart actually making a new swing high. I'm looking at the August high, which is also a Fibonacci level, uh, currently around 52.53. So it might be an important chart to watch uh, as well. 
Top performing group today, solar stocks. Look at FSLR, which is First Solar. Sunrun is one we'll look at in a moment. First Solar up 8% today. What's interesting about the chart of FSLR, made a new high around 230 a couple months ago. This is in mid-May. From there, pulled back. Did get below the 50-day, but held above the 200-day moving average. Now finding support around 180 and rotating uh, back higher. Today, a nice move to the upside. The momentum getting stronger. Looking at those previous highs around 230. What's interesting is in that same group, you have a chart like run. And if you look at the chart of run, I would argue you have what's called an inverted head and shoulders bottoming pattern, or what they also call a Buddha bottom. Uh, go figure why that is. Uh, I'll leave that to you. But uh, what an inverted head and shoulders is, think of a head and shoulders top, the head with two shoulders. Think of someone standing on their head and you have the head here, the left shoulder, the right shoulder. The neckline is what's so important. So you connect the peak in April, connect the peak in June. You can see today with this 12% gain in sun run, we powered above that neckline. So the things that I would be looking for as the momentum has strengthened, as the stock is breaking out of this base, do we get a follow through? So tomorrow, Wednesday, do you get further upside showing that people are willing to additionally accumulate above this already significant gain? And can we get above the 200 day moving average currently around 2275 or so? Those would be the things I might look for. But for now, the break higher on Sunrun today, besides being a nice move, also completes that inverted head and shoulders bottoming pattern. I had alluded to some of the key stocks reporting earnings this week, two important ones you want to watch for, Tesla and Netflix. These, of course, part of that FANG sort of in FANG plus group. This has been an area of the market showing remarkable strength. While a lot of sectors and groups have been struggling, charts like Tesla and uh, Netflix have been doing just fine. Tesla continuing to make new highs for the year. Today, moving higher, another 3.2%, up above 290, getting really close to 300, which is interesting because that's the peak from August and September of last year. Look at that consistent resistance level. We've round trip now from down to all the way to 100 on an adjusted basis back up to these previous highs. Can we power above there? For now, it's showing strength. I'm concerned about the momentum not being as particularly strong. However, the trends overall remaining pretty positive. And I think overall, uh, we'll learn a lot, of course, from this week uh, when we get to earnings. Netflix would be the other one that I would highlight for you. Now, it's interesting about Netflix still showing a pretty clear bearish momentum divergence, which means at the end of this week, we're going to look back and either see that this bearish momentum divergence was one of the most prescient symbols ever or, or signals ever showing that renewed strength on weaker momentum as being a danger sign. However, a break above this resistance, we've stalled out around 450. Do the earnings this week provide a catalyst to push above resistance and indicate further upside uh, potential to be had for Netflix. I think that could be uh, could be pretty telling. Final chart we probably have time for would be JP Morgan. If you're looking at JPM, you can see this stock was in a basing pattern, hit a peak a number of times around uh, 142.50. That's the resistance level uh, here in February, in May, and then again in June. We broke above there and now continuing to push to the upside. Overall, that's a trend that continues to be positive, but watch the overbought conditions. All right, that's it for today's market recap. We're going to come back with the final bar mailbag. Before we do so, a couple housekeeping announcements. First off, we love to hear from you. Our email is the best way to get your questions to us. Anything about technical analysis, market structure, market history, the stock charts platform, anything is fair game. Our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at final bar SCTV. We're on YouTube, of course, and just put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts TV YouTube channel. We'd love to hear from you. Hope to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment, end of this week. Also, we have a little summer special, which is actually not so little. It's one of the biggest discounts we've ever given on the Stock Charts platform. What did it give you sort of a flash sale in the summer months? If you go to stockcharts.com slash special, if you're a current subscriber, you can extend your membership using the current low rates through the end of this month, and I would encourage you to do it now. Also, if you've never uh, been a Stock Charts paid member, you thought about it, this is a really good time to do so. You can lock in a pretty low price. You can lock in uh, multiple months, if not a year. The longer you uh, you sign up for, the better deal you're going to get. It's a really good opportunity to take advantage of some of the best and most popular features of the Stock Charts platform. I would argue it is so incredibly reasonably priced relative to what you're going to get and to uh, and the ability to enhance your investment decisions. Go to stockcharts.com special to get more information on that limited time summer sale. 
Also, I'll be doing a webcast coming up tomorrow on Tuesday, the 18th, 1 o'clock Eastern, called Moving Average Strategies for Investors. Over my uh, time in the uh, in the industry, I've often been asked about moving averages. People are asking me which ones they should use, why certain ones are more popular than others, how you can use them to minimize noise, what you use them for in terms of managing risk, how you can combine all of these strategies and how they relate to other technical inputs. We're going to answer all those questions and look at a bunch of examples together. It's coming up Tuesday, the 18th, 1 o'clock Eastern. You can sign up for that free event at marketmisbehavior.com slash moving average. Let's go on to our um, final bar mailbag. Thanks again, everyone, for all the great questions that you've sent to us. And get, let's get right to question number one. Dave, do you see further upside for coin as it's now overbought? And I love that question, thinking about you know the upside potential in a stock versus the fact that it's overbought, bringing up the chart of uh, coin here. And this is one of the stocks that I mentioned in that uh, article. If you go to the articles tab again, I, I wrote an article on uh, on Friday called Absolutely Everything Goes Up. And it's focusing on some of those particular areas of the market showing strength, and particularly the ARK Innovation Fund, those biggest names really doing a really good job of, of pushing to the upside. If you look at Coinbase, that 80, 85 level was really important. And that was the resistance from February of this year, also retesting it in March of this year. And then we broke above it, really getting above that level, pulled back and then broke above it uh, you know, through, uh, through last week. I think it was pretty meaningful. What's really telling, I think, on the chart of coin for now is this big update, which was actually Thursday of last week. Then we had Friday session and then today's session. We had that big move above $100 a share. That's a big round number, which often causes investors to sort of take a step back and think, OK, is this really a three digit stock or not? Sort of a natural time to pull back and reflect on where we've come from. So far, the stock's actually holding that gain. So, you know, a lot of times you have a big move higher, even a gap higher. And then we fizzle out and that shows you that was an exhaustion gap or sort of that last gasp higher where a bunch of demand came in, but all of a sudden no one's left to push the price higher. In this case, you're not really seeing that yet. And I would say as long as Coinbase is holding 100, that's actually a pretty good breakout. Now, what's interesting is we're now testing the August high. On a closing basis, we've already made a new swing high because the high close was just below uh, $100 uh, here. But on an intraday basis, we got all up to around 115 and we're sort of touching that uh, just barely over the last couple of days. So you know, getting above those August highs from last year, I think would be a nice follow through. Holding 100 for me is the most important point. Now, to your question, you're asking, but what about that it's overbought? And I would say, I would say this, right? Number one, overbought on its own is actually a good thing, right? If our goal is to buy stocks and ETFs and have them go up, which hopefully that is your your ideal goal, being overbought just means it's actually working. That means the tools you're using are actually working pretty well because the price is actually rotating to the upside. The question I think comes down to more of a tactical approach, right? Is this a good chart for my portfolio for my time frame? Yes or no? Is this the right moment to pull the trigger? And that's where I think the question could have a very different answer. What we often would say with charts like uh, like Coinbase, even charts that are a little more extended, things like Apple and uh, Home Builders, some of those names that I mentioned that have been in a nice uptrend for quite some time, you often want to wait for some sort of pullback and, and get some sort of higher low. That buy on the dips approach is a commonly uh, referred to approach. That's something I use in my own process. And that's a way of capturing a strong trend that's actually had a bit of a pullback in the short term. What that means is it's just much easier to get in because you're pulling into, uh, you know, the, the price is pulling back, which means you're getting in at a better level. You're getting a better fill, as you would call it. And if enough buyers come in and buy on the dips, that creates the higher low and that creates the uptrend and you get a nice boost right out of your, uh, your entry point. So it could be a bit overextended. A pullback on a chart like Coinbase could be a really good opportunity. I'm looking at $100 a share to see if that is able to hold. Great question, by the way, and thanks so much for asking about Coinbase, one of those stocks that's had a really renewed sense of strength over the last four to six weeks. Here's question number two. Dave, how do you choose stocks to invest in initially? And you had a great email question that you sent in. Thanks so much for, for doing it. I'm um, talking about you know different things, you, and you mentioned that um, things that had been recommended to you over time, uh, you know, stocks with moving average signals like a crossover by the rebound after a 52 week low. So something makes a new low and then it bounces higher. I'm thinking of financials when I'm when I'm drawing that out with my hands. I'm thinking of like a, a financials, like a, a bank that got beaten down and now has started to rally. Buy when a stock hits a new 52 week high. Talk about a totally different approach. Stocks with strong fundamentals and look for them to break out of some uh, some level. 
I don't think any of those answers are particularly wrong. And I, and, and here's how I would answer that question. In general, there are a lot of different ways to, to do this thing that we're doing. And I will tell you from my experience at a large money management firm, when I was at Fidelity, we had value managers and we had growth managers. And growth managers in general were loving buying stocks, making new highs. They would look at a chart like Coinbase or Apple. And if they thought that the stock could triple from there, they'd have no problem buying a breakout because they're happy riding it, uh, riding that continued perspective growth further and further. A value manager, though, would never touch the new highs list. So we'd be looking for stocks making new lows or stocks you know, undervalued relative to some metric, whether that's a fundamental valuation like PE or price to book, or it's a technical valuation, something like an RSI, something being oversold. I would argue that there are times and places for both of those kind of techniques. And I don't think you want to pigeonhole yourself as one type of person, right? One type of chart, and that's it. I think what you have to remember, there are different parts of the cycle when different approaches are going to work a little better uh, than, than others. So a number of the things you mentioned, I've seen people use those and use them successfully. The key is that they have a good process and they apply that process consistently. And that's where I think it comes down to some of the benefits of using the uh, the scan engine. So what, what you asked me was, how do I choose to invest? And I will tell you, first off, I don't do a lot of individual stocks on my own investing because I found a long time ago, I with my limited multitasking ability, I could either be really good at investing my own money and then be less good about talking about and helping other people do it, or I could help you. Well, that's what I, I get way more excitement out of talking about the charts and, and working with others to help them improve their decision than I do managing my own my own portfolio to be totally upfront with you. So as a result, I try to limit what I'm doing on individual stocks. And for compliance, I was never able to uh, you know invest in a lot of individual stocks. So I sort of got away from that. I focus more on bigger ETFs, more on asset allocation, but I do have a portion of portfolio inspired by, we'll say, Gaddison, Grace, and Rose with their core and explore model. We have a core position, then you have an exploratory portion, which gives you the opportunity to do all sorts of uh, different things. The sweet spot for me, the type of chart that I would love to buy anytime I see it would be something like Home Builders back at you know, the end of May. And we highlighted that as a really good opportunity, uh, potentially because it was a strong trend, right? The last six to 12 months had been very strong, but it had pulled back. I actually call this the fat pitch chart. Think of it as that pitch over the plate, just hanging there. You have to take a swing at it because it's just a really good potential setup. This is a long-term uptrend, but a short-term pullback. And in the institutional world, that's actually a commonly used technique. Now, if you're managing a you know, $50 billion fund, you also have liquidity issues. So if you want to buy a big position in a stock or an ETF, you, you, know, you need the opportunity to buy into weakness because otherwise you'll artificially push the prices higher, to be, to, be, uh, to be honest with you. So as a result, buying into weakness provides some additional liquidity, meaning when you want to buy, there are willing sellers that are there to uh, give you some shares to, uh, to accumulate. So overall, that's sort of the thing that I look at. But I would say in my process, there are a number of different setups that I look for. That is one setup I very much like, which are strong uptrends that have pulled back. I like things that have been beaten down and make a higher low and then break out of a base, which is called a ba big base breakout. Bill Doan, who was one of my Fidelity predecessors, made a career, made a living on finding big base breakouts. And I really understood that signal, a rotation from downtrend phase to uptrend phase. So those are two of the things that I would look for. And I have a lot of scans looking for stocks making new three-month highs, stocks that have pulled back to key moving averages. Those are the types of scans that I run all the time to try to identify setups in those particular configurations, among others. Those are two things I would maybe suggest you with. But, but again, all the ones that you asked me about, I have seen people apply those. The kicker is to have an approach and apply it consistently. That's my main goal uh, to, uh, to way to answer your question. Thanks so much for that one, by the way. Next one, Dave, is there a benefit of viewing a chart on linear scale versus logarithmic scale? And it's funny, we had a lot of questions over the years running the final bar about these different scales. If you look, most of the charts, if not all of them that I show on the final bar have a logarithmic scale. And it's technically called a semi-log scale because the y-axis is on a log scale. The x-axis, of course, is not. The dates are given equal uh, equal billing on the uh, on the x-axis, but the y-axis is scaled. Now, the reason why you do that is because it solves a problem of scaling and, and really percentage moves. If you think about a stock making a continuous 1% move higher, the chart's going to look a little wonky. It's not going to look like a straight line because the straight line would be based on an equal dollar amount. An arithmetic scale gives, it gives equal space to equal dollar amounts. 
a log scale or a semi-log chart gives equal weight to similar percentage amount. So 1% will be the same down here or up there. That's why you can see these boxes kind of get bigger the further you go because these are bigger percentage moves, right? $2 from 56 to 58 is a much bigger gain than $2 from 86 to 88. And so you scale it based on a logarithmic scale. The traditions of technical analysis were to do everything in, in arithmetic skill because honestly, it was just much easier to chart by hand. It was really hard to figure out those uh, log scalings by hand, although we had plenty of evidence from uh, earlier uh, editions of uh, of the Fidelity chart room, also other chart rooms uh, in uh, you know Prudential, the Smith Barney chart room and others uh, that use log scale. And they would use a log scale paper and actually calculate it. It was really hard to do and it was much easier to do arithmetic scale. In reality, I would say most of the time log scale makes sense. It doesn't make much of a difference if you're looking at a really short time frame. So if you're looking at 10 days of data, log scale doesn't mean a whole lot because there aren't enough moves to really have the scale benefit you. The benefits of log scale is if you're looking at a longer term chart, right? So think of something like this and go out to like 30 years on the S&P, which is way too much for a daily chart. But this is what a regular log scale chart looks like. Look at how at the bottom, the scale is expanded because these are much lower prices. And so this is what the, the chart really means. This is what the returns of the S&P should mean to you as an investor. But if we take off the log scale and you can see what happens is the low prices are kind of compressed. The higher prices are exaggerated. But in reality, that's not what your experience would have been because our portfolio evolves in percentage terms. That's how we tend to think of it. So 90% of the time, if not more, log scale is the right answer, and it doesn't make a difference on a short term frame. So I would say more often than not, if not always, use log scale. That's what I do. And, and quick story, in the Fidelity chart room, the chairman of the, the board, Ned Johnson, would come around, and if he ever saw a chart that was not uh, log scale, we would get in serious trouble. And he would find out of 3,000 charts on the wall, he would find the one and would notice that it was didn't look quite right. And that's because it wasn't on log scale. So I would use log scale. Um, and, and again, there, there are people that swear by linear scales. And I think it's more for trading. It doesn't make a huge difference. And I think it's going to be uh, just fine. Next question. To confirm a bottom on N phase, ticker ENPH, does price need to make a new high? A really great question. Let's look at N phase. I mentioned some of the other stocks in this group. In our market recap, talk about First Solar and uh, and Sunrun, um, uh, the, uh, the the ETF TAN T A N is a good one to look at as well. Just get a read on the space, but there's some interesting differentiation between the charts right now. Your question was, do we need to break? I guess to say, right, if this is a, um, a a double bottom, right, which sort of the May and June lows are right about the same, <clears throat> I think that's right around 155 dollars a share. We've now rotated higher. Do we need to break above there? I don't I don't know if there's a right answer to this question. Um, you know, I, I would say this is more of a um a judgment call in terms of how you would want to use the chart and really more how aggressive you would want to be. Uh and and, and here's what I mean. There are a number of ways. You're what you're trying to do is basically just qualify or or understand when this downtrend has now stabilized and when this consolidation phase is over and that the price is going down. So a very aggressive way to play this would be say, okay. I'm just going to look to see when we get a double bottom. And when I see right here in late June that we've tried to make a new low and failed to do so, maybe I buy in right there. If I see that we were oversold in May and not oversold in late June, maybe that's enough for me. And I would buy in here. Now, if you do that, if you're buying sort of that falling knife move, what I would remind you is you could be wrong. And if you're wrong, you better have a good money, money management process. So if you're buying lows, if you're buying weakness, you need to make sure you use some sort of stop consistently because if you're wrong, the price can just keep going down and absolutely crush you very, very quickly. So that's the danger of buying into new lows is that you're wrong and the price keeps going longer. So going lower. So the way you avoid that is having a good money management process. Maybe a more conservative way to do that was what, what you're implying, right? Maybe getting above the 50 day moving average would be enough to tell me uh, that that's okay. Maybe getting above this resistance here, which I think is what you implied in your question. Maybe that's the breakout, which today we actually did just finally close above there. Maybe I'm more looking at a trend line coming off the highs like this one. And I've seen enough now today to say, all right, this is a trend line from the December high and the April high. We broke above that, and that's enough for me. Maybe it's a combination. That's where you have to remember, right? There's no right way to interpret this. It's all about 
how uh, risk averse or how uh, you know risk aware you want to be in your in your trading. I've seen, seen some people that take a half a position on the uh, on the retest of the low when they're right, and we break above this trend line, then we complete it and take the other fifty percent. So we're half filled here, we're completely filled there. I've seen some people that would buy an initial position when we get above the 50 day and then complete it when we break it above uh, the new highs. I think all of those could be valid approaches. Uh, I think it's more up to you and how conservative or how aggressive you wanna be in translating the technical work into an actual investment decision. So I'm giving you a lot of choices and not enough right answers because I don't think there is necessarily a right answer. I think it's more a question uh, for you. And I find people that are really happy being aggressive and others that are very happy being more conservative. In my own trading, I am way more on the conservative side. I would much rather let the chart convince me that the trend is now positive. Uh, but I would say based on any of those things that I have said, end phase for now, completing that rotation, I would say from a technical perspective, nice breakout to the upside for now, if we follow through tomorrow. Final question, Dave, I love this one. How come there are no point and figure charts on your mindful investor chart list? What gives? Here's a story, right? If you look, I actually do have them. So point of order, if you look at my mindful investor chart list, I would say I would consider the bullish percent indexes point and figure charts. And, and, and to be honest with you, the history of the bullish percent index is actually to show them using a point and figure chart. For me, I just like using different breadth indicators interchangeably. I like having charts where I'm able to swap them in and out. So having one of them on a point figure chart and everything else different just doesn't really fit with the way that I like to go through my routine. So I adapted the bullish percent indexes into a, into a candle chart or a bar chart. I like to show them in the top half of the panel because I'm always focused on where we're at. And then I like to glance down and see how that relates to the price action. So I do actually have the bullish percent index for the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100. These are all based on point and figure charts. So it's actually running 500 point and figure charts in the background and saying, are the is the most recent signal a buy signal or a sell, sell, sell signal? And that's how it's uh, calculating them. So I actually am using the point and figure charts. If you, if you think of it that way, if you'll give me that, then it actually is included. You know, it's great. My conversation last week, it was with John Lewis, uh, who uh, works at Dorsey Wright uh, and associates Dorsey Wright. Tom Dorsey, of course, is one of the you know foremost experts on, on the planet on point figure chart. I think of him. I think of Jeremy Duplessis, uh, who wrote some fascinating books uh, on point and figure charting. Really interesting, thoughtful works. I, I worked with Ken Tower. I actually used to grade the CMT exams with Ken. Particularly, we'd grade the point and figure chart uh, question together and uh, compare notes on them. And, and I think all of them have really great uh, expertise. Conversations with John, as I mentioned, I think on the air, uh, was a, it was a reminder to me. Why don't I look at more point and figure charts on there? I, I appreciate your question. I am going to be thinking about that because I, I do. I love the simplicity of a point and figure chart. I love how it takes away the noise, which I feel like as an investor, as an analyst, one of my main goals in life is to minimize noise and maximize my focus on the most important stuff. And I think point and figure charts in a lot of ways uh, can do that. So thanks for that question. That's a uh, helpful nudge for me to uh, to revisit that. Maybe we'll see a point and figure chart appear on the uh, Mindful Investor chart, chart list not too far from today. That's all the time we have for the mailbag. Folks, thanks so much for sending in those great questions. Please keep them coming. We'll do another mailbag at the end of this week, but we have to wrap today's show now. Let's go right to the three and three. Three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Chart number one, we're finishing where we ended here. We're looking at point and figure uh, charts, talking about the benefits of minimizing noise. And I just wanted to highlight, because I didn't get to mention too much of the detail. On this particular chart, the bullish percent index for the S&P 500 is back above 70. Now, the fact that it's gone above 70 is actually not a bad thing. That tells you that the trend is positive. If you look at previously, when we've broken above 70, that's actually been, in some cases, in the midst of a strong rally. The problem is when we rotate back below the 70 level. Now, I've highlighted in red when this indicator is above 70. Look over the last 18 months. Every time we've gone above 70 and then gone back below, that's the end of the red shaded areas. And you'll notice that it's pretty much consistently the end of a meaningful rally period. So this chart is telling me two things. Number one, we're in a big time rally. I get that from looking at all the charts we mentioned in our market recap and many, many more we didn't have time for. But if and when that goes below 70%, which will happen at some point, that's where you will hear me with a megaphone uh, signal a, uh, a very uh, important call that uh, we are potentially rotating to the downside because this bullish breath condition has now been alleviated. Not yet, but certainly something to keep an eye on. I think that's an important chart to watch. 
Chart number two, I mentioned, uh, you know, the the names and the stocks that have worked, the charts that have been in a position of strength for quite some time. I wanted to highlight out of the iShares family, I actually used the chart list feature. I imported all of the iShares ETFs, which I downloaded from their website, put all the tickers into a chart list. I look at all their charts kind of regularly and I'll scan through them and I'll look at the scooter rankings. These are the top three ranked ETFs in the iShares family as of yesterday's close. The first one, IBLC, which is the blockchain and tech ETF. You can see making a new 52-week high uh, just uh, last week on uh, on Friday session, new closing high on Thursday. Second one's technology. This is actually IVW. It's related to the XLK. It's sort of the iShares version of that sector spider ETF. Similar idea, making a new closing high today and continue to push to the upside. The third one is the home construction ETF, ticker ITB, which we highlighted as well. All three of these above an upward sloping 50-day moving average. Look at how all of them have had pullbacks over the last couple of months and have often held above that ascending 200-day moving average, as, or excuse me, 50-day moving average I'm showing here. As long as those trends persist, I have no problem holding charts that are working. Strength tends to beget further strength. Finally, sticking with this same sort of chart style, I'm looking at three sector ETFs that I think are worth paying attention to. We're so focused on growth. And again, growth has continued to dominate value in 2023, even recently, as some of those major growth ETFs showed signs of a bit of a pullback. Sectors, sectors like industrials showed renewed strength. Overall, growth is still working, but value is starting to come into its own. The XLI has made a new 52-week high in the uh, a number of times in the last month. You can see the XLB, the material sector, is actually testing resistance right around 84, very close to making a new high for the year. The financial sector a little bit uh, behind there, of course, but a lot of earnings at the end of last week, even more this week, could be some potential upside catalysts, could be some clear signs that we're not going to get any further than we have. But in any cases, I think these are the charts that are important to watch. Value-oriented parts of the market have been forgotten with uh, for a lot of investors. I'm seeing certain uh, certainly strength in the last four to six weeks, really strong charts with really strong upside potential as long as those trends continue. All right, folks, that's a wrap for today's show. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close. By the way, we have a live Q&A coming up this Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on our YouTube channel. Make sure you go to our YouTube channel called Stock charts tv set the notification you won't miss when we go live that'll be coming up this wednesday the 19th at 1 p.m eastern for stock charts in redmond washington i'm dave keller be well stay safe have a good night